few years ago, I experienced some traumatic things that have changed my life forever. But a few weeks ago, I got out of bed and I ended up doing my morning routine, putting the coffee pot on, getting dressed, going in to the living area where I sat down and opened up my laptop and started to Google the word warrior. For you see, over the years, I have been called many different things, including wife, daughter, sister, friend, mentor, advocate, executive director, barista, graduate, student, and warrior. The word warrior, though, is a word that has not sat right with me um, as I have experienced um, these other words. For you see, as a wife, when my husband and I get dressed up and go out on a date, I feel like I'm a wife. When I'm sitting in classes and I see the amount of work I need to do, the mountain of textbooks, as well as all of the papers I have to write, I see myself as a student. Even when I worked at Starbucks and smelt the aroma of the espresso folding into the cup, and as I steamed the milk and put it in the cup, and would hand a latte to our customers, I felt like a barista. But I am not Wonder Woman, and I, over the past um, bit, as Wonder Woman came out, I have come to realize that I cannot save the world by myself. I have no ability to do so. In addition, I am not like many of you who have trained to fight in combat and who are fighting in combat, and I did not associate with that either. But as I was sitting and was processing what warrior meant as I Googled it, I saw that a warrior is a person who's not only engaged and experienced in battle, but a warrior is somebody who bravely fights for freedom. That struck me rather deeply, and I got up and went into the kitchen and started to wash the dishes as the warm water would flow over my hands and as the soap bubbles came up. I felt tears running down my face because for the first time, I realized that I am a warrior as a survivor of human trafficking. I am a warrior. This um, warriorship has caused me to not only fight for my own freedom from being a, a sex slave, but this has caused me to also fight for the internal battles where I have struggled with eating disorders and depression and self-injury. And this warriorship has also enabled me to walk into a place where I am a service provider, providing services to survivors of human trafficking locally here in Colorado, as well as across the world. I am a warrior. I am a person who fights for freedom. One of my favorite quotes is by Eleanor Roosevelt, and she once stated, freedom makes a huge requirement of every human being, and with freedom comes responsibility. It's with that responsibility that I stand here today, and I am not only am a free person, but I believe that every single person who's in this room is also free and also carries a responsibility to use that freedom to help other people. My story starts when I was born in Toronto, Canada, to a family that perpetrated great evil against me. Um, it's hard for me to put into words every single thing that was done. But it started out with um, child sex um, abuse, and then it turned into child pornography, and then it turned into me being sold in our neighborhood to countless men and women who purchased me and purchased my body. It soon turned into me then, after being sold in the suburban neighborhoods, being taken into the US for the sole purpose 
of being sold for sex. And as I was taken on the circuit, I experienced horrific things that no one should experience. I experienced things that no one should have to go through. And in that midst of that time, in the midst of those experiences, I um, ended up not being allowed to go to school. And I remember the darkness um, of being locked into a room and what it was like to look through the window and not just look through the window, but look at the people on the other side of the window. Across from my house growing up, there was an elementary school and that elementary school um, had kids walking around with backpacks and they would play in the playground and they would have their paper sack lunches. And I dreamed and I longed to be able to engage with not only academics like that, but to be able to engage with other kids and with other human beings in that fashion. The trauma I was going through was so great that I honestly did not know that it wasn't normal, but then I would look out the window and I would see these kids and I knew that there was something starkly different between my experience and their experience. When I was 21, I actually was in Kansas City where I was at a hotel and a precious woman, she um, saw me in the lobby of the hotel and she saw some of the red flags of a victim of human trafficking. Some of the things that this precious woman saw was not only trauma responses, but she saw the ways that I would startle. She saw that I would not look at people in the eyes and this woman because she had training in being able to recognize human trafficking. She came up to me and gave me her contact information on a small piece of paper. And I would recommend not doing that. There's other ways that people can respond. But come to find out, this dear woman had a doctorate degree in mental health and she was working with survivors of human trafficking here locally in Colorado. And so she gave me that information on that piece of paper and she's like, you can call me if you ever want help. You can call me if you ever need anything. So I ended up back in Canada where I absolutely terrified, scared that somebody would hear me on the phone, I made a phone call to this woman. And as she picked up the phone, and as the conversation started, she started to speak truth into me and over me. She told me, Jessa, did you know that you are not defined by sex? She said, Jessa, did you know at the age of 21, you can make a choice now. And if you want to make the choice to leave, I will help you do so. That conversation was the start of several conversations that took place over a few weeks and then took place over a few months. And as I continued to speak to her, we put together an escape plan and I, at the age of 21, was able to escape. I landed in Denver at DIA and I walked off the plane and was really scared because when all you've known is slavery, freedom can seem so hard and so scary. What I did was when I walked out, I got in her car and my senses began to come alive. I felt the sun come down on my arms and on my face and it was like something started to grow inside of me. I was able, as we were driving on I-25 to Colorado Springs, I saw tumbleweed for the very first time in my life and it delighted me to no end. Tumbleweed is so fun when it moves and rolls down the road and as I saw that, I made this promise to myself that someday I was going to interact with the world with that same kind of lightness, with that same kind of freedom, with that same kind of joy. And so I got to the house and we basically walked in and I had nothing and I curled up on a ball at the safe house and started to sob. And that was my first night of not being sold 
as a sex slave. It was my first night of not being used as a victim of human trafficking. And I had a tourist visa, though, and sadly, that tourist visa did not last a long time. And I found myself, at the end of 2009, having to figure out what I wanted to do. I was finding myself in this place of needing to figure out where I wanted to go because I had to go back to Canada. And so the director of the safe house, she put a map down in the living room and she said, OK, let's go ahead, let's drop a coin, and let's kind of look in that area for resources. And so my coin landed in British Columbia. And so we started to Google resources for survivors of human trafficking. And nine years ago, I can tell you that there is not much out there for survivors of human trafficking. We were still, um, as a society, learning what human trafficking was and trying to figure out ways that we could respond. And so eventually I found a rape and crisis center that got me connected to a safe house. And we took a road trip to Canada where I ended up entering that safe house and not just entering that safe house, but started to get integrated back into Canadian culture. And during that time, I got to meet some incredible people and people that I believe are going to be the world changers because they are fighters. And these people, they gave me information and taught me and told me, don't go to this place in Vancouver. Don't go to this place. This place is not safe. And I was like, OK, I got this, and I'm going to be OK. Sadly, though, the safe house I was at shut down. Um, the Olympics was just about to start, the 2010 Winter Olympics. And I ended up um, having to figure out what I was going to do. Um, the government was removing money from um, basic things like the government hospitals and the schools and the resources that I was accessing as a person who was in oppression. And um, so I eventually, um, long story short, had about 12 hours to find a new place to live and ended up homeless in Vancouver. But in the back of my mind, um, I had these places in my head, do not go here, do not go there, because of what my dear friends at that safe house had told me. And so I look back at that time and I was like, I believe that I was really wise because like I would miss those locations in town and I would go dumpster diving and um, to simply get a cup of coffee and then I'd go for walks and I did a really good job being able to take care of myself and not be re-exploited. But um, sadly, that did not last. I one day, the Olympic church, as it was being run past, um, just before the Olympics started, there was a church that was downtown Vancouver that was advertising this big pancake breakfast. And I was very vulnerable. I was in a new city all by myself. I was hungry. I was homeless. And so I was like, yay, pancakes. Let me have pancakes, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I will be so happy for the rest of the day. And so I got my pancakes. It was this big mountain of pancakes. And I walked downstairs and got my orange juice and my coffee. And I sat down at a table. And as I sat down at that table, I um, had an empty chair beside me and a woman. She came in and she sat down beside me. And one of the first things that was out of her mouth was she said, I think I see abuse on your face. And I was like, whoa, you can see that I've been traumatized. You can see what I've been through. And she was like, yeah, I too have been through sexual abuse as a child and I know what it's like so I can recognize it when I see it in other people. She seemed so sweet, and I was so lonely. She seemed so kind and gentle and compassionate, and I was so hungry for the kindness of a human being in my life. So we built a relationship, and over a couple of days, she would email me all the time. She would call me several times a day, and we went to a spaghetti factory. Once again, I was vulnerable, I was hungry, I was homeless, and I was in this place of desiring to be with somebody who cared. And so we sat down and she said, you can order whatever you want, and not only whatever you want, but let's have all these appetizers come to the table and let's just have a feast. And as we had our feast, I was told by this woman that my hair color needed to change 
that my eye color needed to change, wear contacts, um, glasses, that my clothes needed to change. She told me that she had houses of girls just like me. And not only did she have houses of girls just like me, but that I was her favorite, that she loved me, and that she wanted to be my mom. I eventually, um, that evening, ended up at her apartment. She promised me that we could watch some hockey together, and I was really excited. I um, was really wanting the Canadians to win, and I was like, yes, let's do that. And so I got to her apartment, and as soon as we walked in, she shut the door, and she looked at me, and she said, my name is not the name that I told you it was. And so I was not only scared, but I wasn't really sure what was happening. There was great confusion taking place within my being. I actually ended up that night being gang raped. And then during the 2010 Winter Olympics, after this woman had groomed me, she churned me out. And during the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver, BC, I was trafficked. One of the ways that human trafficking is referenced here in America is by calling it the game. And I can tell you that during the 2010 Winter Olympics, it was not a game for me. Instead, it is an absolute miracle that I'm alive, and that I'm not only alive, but that I'm standing here today and I'm able to do the work that I do, that I'm able to fight for the people that I fight for. And I don't take that for granted. I, um, I cherish it because there are a lot of people out there who are entrapped in slavery today that even this moment are being sold for sex, and that is something I believe we need to fight against. Thankfully, I was able to escape a second time, which doesn't happen to a lot of victims, and I came back to Colorado, where I had experienced hope and safety for the very first time in my life. When I got here, um, it took a lot longer for me to feel safe again and for me to trust again, because not only had I been exploited once as a child within familial trafficking, but now I had trusted again and had been re-exploited again. So how do I know if people say who they really are? And so as I slowly started to take steps, I became scared again because my visa, my tourist visa, was about to expire. That was a really scary place to be. I did not want to unpack my suitcases because I did not know what that would mean for me. I did not want to um, relax because I'm like, I just am gonna have to go back and all I know is that from one side of Canada to the other side of Canada, I have been hurt every single time. And so the board of directors of the Safe House that I was at, they talked to the director of the Safe House and they came up with this amazing idea. They were like, Jessa, we think that you should go to school and get a student visa. And I was like, what? Me, go to school? I have never sat in a classroom my entire life. Why are you telling me I should go to school? And they said, we believe in you. Jessa, we believe in you. They also told me, Jessa, did you know if you can read, you can learn anything? And so I actually went into my bedroom that day and wrote on my arm, if I can read, I can learn anything. And we went to the library and we picked up books. And I um, had these amazing people sit with me through my applications. We did campus tours together. I got my GED. And I celebrated the day that I received that acceptance letter. It was a huge feat for me to be able to be accepted into an academic institution. And not only was it a huge feat, but I was still absolutely terrified. Within that terror, my director of the safe house, she dropped me off at school for my first day of class. And just to give you a picture of what it was like, I got out of the car and I got my brand new backpack. And I sat down in the middle of the parking lot and cried. Class had already started by the time my tears were dried and people had walked past and had looked at me and stared at me and I got inside and started to sit down and that was the start of my academic journey. In 2015, I graduated summa cum laude 
And as I did that class valedictorian speech, I realized how far I had come. I was no longer a victim of human trafficking, and I was not just a survivor of human trafficking, but I was a thriver. Six days after that graduation ceremony, I actually had kind of my fairy tale happen where my husband and I, we got married. And it was the most beautiful day of my life. We danced, we partied, and I realized that true love is possible. My husband makes me a stronger woman. My husband makes me able to stand on stages like today and do the work that I do. We co-founded an organization together called Bridge Hope that bridges resources and foster hope to survivors of human trafficking. And if it wasn't for him, I would not be the executive director of that organization today. One of the things that we do with Bridge Hope is we travel not only across the nation, but we travel around the world training organizations on what human trafficking is in tangible ways to respond. And in those trainings, some of the material that I share and that we share includes the fact that oftentimes when we hear the word sex worker, we often think of a prostitute, an adult who has consented we often think of a slut, a dirty person. We think of easy sex. But when we think of the word victim, we think of things like somebody who is here not by choice, somebody who has been traumatized, somebody who has been used, somebody who has experienced deep pain, not because of themselves, but because of another human being. The thing is, is that oftentimes, the individuals in this category called sex workers are also often, too, victims of human trafficking. Throughout my growing up years, I was called a little P, which stood for a little prostitute. And I am not that today. I am a thriver, and I am not only a thriver, but I am a person who is a worrier. But the reality is we often do not put the two together. The definition of human trafficking is um, the recruitment, the transportation, the transfer, the harboring or receipt of persons by improper means such as force, fraud, or coercion for improper purposes, including forced labor or sexual exploitation. The three words that are very vital for us to recognize here is that force is the physical restraint or serious physical harm, including rape, beatings that are intended to hurt a person. And so force can be seen within my background and my situation where when I was in Vancouver, I was gang raped to break my will, to make me bow down and be scared of this woman and her friends. Also, too, we have fraud, which is intended to result in financial or personal gain through using um, fraud in that process. And so in my story, when this woman told me that her name was such and such, and then she took me to her home, and I was told that it was completely opposite than anything I could have ever imagined, that is fraud, and coercion is the plan and pattern intended to cause a person to believe that failure to perform an act would result in harm or restraint. And this looks like when she told me if I did not go out on the streets and make money for her and her friends that I would be hurt and that people I loved would be hurt as well, and that people in Colorado, she actually had the number of the women in Colorado at the safe house, and she told me that bad things would happen to her, and so that is coercion. The thing is, if, if somebody is under the age of 18, though, first, fraud and coercion do not need to be proven. If there is commercial sex acts taking place, that individual is automatically a victim. So for example, if there's child pornography going on, if a minor underneath the age of 18 is having to do commercial sex work or under that terminology, they are automatically a victim of human trafficking. 
There's different kinds of human trafficking. There's familial trafficking, like I experienced, where people that are supposed to take care of you do not take care of you, but instead they are a part of the problem of perpetrating that great evil on that individual. Survival trafficking is where somebody is having to exchange commercial sex acts to be able to have a sweater, a warm place to live, a warm place to sleep, a hamburger. Survival trafficking happens and takes place because of many different societal things, including homelessness, including poverty. This is a reality within our society. We also have sex trafficking, labor trafficking, rural versus urban trafficking. So with urban trafficking, we see a lot of pimp control trafficking, gang control trafficking. And with rural trafficking, we see a lot of unfamiliar trafficking as well as recruitment, where traffickers go in and promise individuals within that rural community that, you know what, I can give you so much greater than what you already have. And it could be through advertisements of modeling, it could be through many other different means. But that is very common, where that recruiter then takes that victim into the city. Foreign versus domestic, I've experienced foreign trafficking as a Canadian citizen, but domestic trafficking happens here. There are victims here locally in Colorado Springs that I am currently working with, and this is an epidemic. We know that although human trafficking is taking place all around the world, we know that the one common denominator is the fact that human trafficking always exploits the vulnerable. So that could be vulnerabilities that human trafficking victims have, could be homelessness, could be a lack of education, refugees, immigrants, some other vulnerabilities that they have are lack of supportive relationships. Also too, the inability to be able to process traumas that have happened in the past. This is really necessary for us to fully understand because everyone who is vulnerable is at risk for exploitation, which means that I honestly still have vulnerabilities in my life. And most likely each of you have vulnerabilities as well that are unique to you and unique to your personhood. And you know what, traffickers, they are really good at spotting those vulnerabilities, those unique vulnerabilities to the individuals that they traffic. And then not only do they spot them, but then typically there's a recruiter who comes out and recruits them and then an individual who traffics them. Sometimes the spotter, the recruiter, and the trafficker can be the same person. Sometimes they're different people, but the main common denominator is that vulnerabilities are exploited. Within exploiting these vulnerabilities, human trafficking is a business. It is very high um, profit and very low risk. And on Amazon, there is actually 22 pimp manuals on teaching pimps on how to be pimps. And that is just a small indicator of how human trafficking has become culturally acceptable in some ways. And so as we fight against human trafficking, we have to fight against this culture that is looking at Pimping as a good idea, as a game, as glamorous. We need to change the ways that we see um, the sexualization of individuals within our culture. How to identify victims? Um, first of all, it's not just women, it's boys, girls, and men. And uh, um, there's a statistic that came out in 2008 that said as high as 50% of individuals who are experiencing, children who are experiencing commercial sexual exploitation are boys. 50% of victims that are minors that are experiencing human trafficking are boys. And this is something that breaks my heart because our society is not yet catching on to that, that this is a problem that our boys face in our community. In October, Operation Cross Country is the day when the FBI does a nationwide sting. And on that one day in October, 17 kids were recovered from Colorado. And 10 of those kids were boys. And so being able to expand our perspective and see this as a greater issue is needed. Some red flags include multiple cell phones, never alone. So it could be with a male or a female, like my last pimp. I'm talking about the game which I mentioned is an element of 
um, verbiage used to talk about human trafficking, looking down when talking to you, so like I did at the hotel where I was afraid to make eye contact because within the trafficking culture, um, there is this rule that if you look another person in the eyes, that you could be then churned up, um, and that basically means where pimps then you belong to that other pimp or that other trafficker. So looking in the eyes is not socially acceptable when you're a victim in human trafficking and you're being victimized. And so that was something that I struggled with, to learn how to look people in the eyes. But also, too, we can have very belligerent affect responses as well, where somebody is so angry because of how great the trauma is that they'll just be very belligerent towards you, has expensive things that were gifted, or expresses that he or she needs to pay somebody back for something. This is very common. So um, I was working with a young girl not too long ago who um, was sitting at a table with me. We were eating lunch, and she started to tell me that somebody at her school started to give her all of these jeans and shoes and purses. And she looked at me and very sincerely said, Jessa, I need to get a job. And I was like, oh, hon, you need to get a job? All right, how old are you? And she went on to say that she was 14 years old, but that she felt such a strong pressure to pay them back, that they were getting stronger in the need to pay them back, that she did not know what to do. And that is one way that traffickers work, is they give things and then say, you need to pay it back. And so um, debt bondage. Um, is very common as well. Isolation and clothing, that is not um, common for this type of year. So actually just last week I was at Starbucks and there was a sweet girl who had her extremely high heels on and a very short skirt. And it was one of the coldest days of last week. Absolutely frigid outside and she didn't have a coat on. She just had um, like a hoodie that didn't match her dress and um, heavy makeup. And so being able to recognize if they have appropriate clothing, and so being able to then make the appropriate phone calls and make the appropriate reports so that wellness checks could be done and make sure that she's okay. Older boyfriend, tattoos of initials or money-related brandings, symptoms of DV, working conditions, lack of ID, also two past traumas frequently out of town. And one of the things that we need to also state is that for each sphere of influence and each profession, some of these are gonna change. So for medical providers, red flags could look different than they do for law enforcement. And red flags for law enforcement could look different than what they do for military. And so being able to recognize that we need to know what red flags look like within our spheres of influence. One of the things I say is if you are out in the community around civilians, this is a phone number that you can call. You can make anonymous reports if you just see something that just does not sit right. If you see three to five of those red flags, you can go ahead and make this phone call and make a report and they'll go ahead and follow through and take through um, the necessary steps to make sure that person's okay. So after hearing all of this information, some of you might be thinking, how did you move from being a victim and going through all of this horrific stuff into being not just a survivor, but being a leader within our community. One of the things I love doing is I love climbing mountains, and I have actually summited about 20 of the 14ers here in Colorado, and it's one of my favorite places for soul care. When you climb mountains, though, it's never a straight trail to the summit. You go down over valleys, you do switchbacks, you climb over boulders, and not only do you climb over boulders, but when you get to that summit, you then have to turn around and come back down. That has been my healing journey, and even over the past couple of weeks as the Olympics have started again, I have gone through another set of triggers, another set of deep pain as I relive some of those experiences and work with my therapist through that. And you know what? It's okay. It is okay to not be fully past something. It's okay to engage on this journey where healing takes time. Also, too, within my healing process, faith and spiritual resiliency has enabled me to engage with the existential questions of my suffering. In addition to that, relationships with people in my life have been a huge part in rewiring maladaptive attachment styles and enabling me to engage healthy, 
with individuals that I um, love and individuals that I work with. Also to photography. The power of the creative arts is absolutely amazing. I have been scared of cameras for as long as I remember. Um, I've mentioned my experiences with child photography, um, pornography and just how that would make me feel so dead and how that would make me hurt so deeply. And so um, a couple of years ago, I was given a camera and I was like, I don't know, is it okay for me to touch it? And at that point, I thought it was the cameras that had hurt me throughout all of those years. But as I got my camera, as I stood behind my camera, as I started to play with my DSLR, I realized that it was not the camera that hurt me, but rather the people behind the camera that did. And so as I walked into this dimension of intention, this person behind the camera, I started to see things that the human eye cannot see without help. This bee, I saw the pollen on the legs and it took me hours to sit so still to be able to get one shot that worked. But yet, throughout my entire childhood, I felt absolutely invisible because people who saw possible red flags did not do anything to help me. And so as I engage with macro photography, I begin to feel like I am able to be a little bit more whole. This picture is a picture that I did of a spider's web that had some morning dew on it. And the light was glistening like rainbows through each of the little droplets. And it's really cool because I've entitled this photo um, A Web of Tears because I believe each of the tears I have shed in the past, as well as each of the tears that I've shed in the, past, the present are very valuable and beautiful, and they are a part of who I am today. Last week in one of my classes, so I'm right now doing my master's in clinical mental health counseling as a step towards a PhD in clinical psychology. In my social cultural class, my professor um, had this exercise that she had the whole entire class engage with. We went outside, and as we were outside, she started to read through a list of questions. Questions like, if you've had access to as many books as you would have ever wanted as a child, take a step forward. But if you've experienced gender-based violence, take a step back. She said, if your parents owned their own home, if they owned their own car, takes two steps ahead. And if you've experienced child sexual abuse or sexual violence, take a step back. As I took my steps back, I ended up being all alone within that place. It was really hard for me. I felt shame that I hadn't felt for a long time. I saw the great depth of the oppression that I've had to push through. And you know what? Some of you in this room today, if you were to answer those questions honestly with me, you might end up in the back where I was. And you are the people that I would like to take just a small minute to talk to right now. You guys have experienced so much. You have survived so much. Maybe you have gone through some similar things like I have, where you have survived human trafficking and moved into a place of being a thriver. Some of you have maybe experienced the death of a loved one, of a friend, that you are still grieving that loss. Some of you have maybe experienced a health diagnosis that you are scared is going to change your life forever. And I want you to know, I want you to know that there is hope in one's past and one's current experiences does not need to define your future. And for those of you who are sitting in your seats going, I don't fit into that category, I would like to take a moment to talk to you as well, because I believe that you guys hold the power to not only re eradicate modern day slavery, but I believe that you hold the power to change this culture and to say that child pornography, to say that human trafficking, to say that child abuse is not okay. 
I believe that you guys hold the power to engage with your community. We're people who might be over here who are experiencing deep pain and need a friend, can engage with you and receive that hope. For you see, concentric circles of pain will always take place. And we hold the power to enter into those concentric circles and engage with people in an authentic and genuine manner. In closing, I do not want you to leave this auditorium, to leave your seats going, wow, what an impactful, amazing story. Because you know what? If you do that, it will stay here and it will not change the world. But instead, what I would like you to do is I would like you to be able to see that you can make a difference. You can educate people in your life about what human trafficking is and teach them about the red flags, teach them about how to identify victims of human trafficking, what to do if they see human trafficking, and you can get them involved in helping victims find freedom. You also hold the power to be able to say no to the trafficking that's happening in the community by saying, I'm not going to engage with the different levels where the culture and society is saying this is okay. So for example, Ikea, about a year ago, posted an advertisement that said, um, strip it, pimp it, couch. And you know what, they were selling a couch that was a pimp it couch. And so as I was able to, um, with a bunch of other survivor leaders, advocate and send them letters and say, you know what, pimping is really painful and dangerous and that it's exploitation and it's human trafficking. We we're able to get that down, but with you guys being able to recognize what this is and being able to stand up against that, I believe that you hold the power to eradicate modern day slavery, and I'm excited to see what is gonna happen through this talk today. I believe that um, hope is love and love is hope, and because love is hope, I would love to just challenge each of you to walk out with giving hope to other people. One person can change another person's life for the rest of their life. You can make a difference. Thank you. This is Chris, thank you for your message. I think I speak for the crowd when I say that your pre presentation was extremely moving and motivational. We have time for one question, if anyone has a question. Hey, thanks, thanks for sharing that really difficult story. Um, as I sit listening to you, or sat listening to you, I was wondering, after you go through all that exploitation, how do you find it in yourself to date a man and actually marry? How does that happen? I love that. So it truly it was a journey the first time John actually asked me out on a date. I said no. I defriended him on Facebook, and we didn't talk for about two years. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? As I had other people in my life, I was actually um, was adopted, and as I engaged with my adoptive dad and my adoptive mom and um, experienced what family was supposed to be, it healed something deeper inside of me, and that also took place as I was in therapy, working in therapy and going to school, and I don't know how to say it, but I feel like I'm a sponge often, and so I feel like I take one experience, I observe it, and then I let it change me and affect me, and so um, when he asked me out, the second time was actually a professor at our school um, approached him and said, John, have you considered dating the Canadian? And John was like, yeah, <laughs> been there, <laughs> done that. And so this professor went on to tell John, I think you should try again. And so John actually approached me one day when it was like snowing this deep. And he came up to me and he was like, have you been bicycling lately? And I was like, no, but I actually just ran a half marathon in LA with one of my professors. And he was like, oh really, I'm training for a half marathon as well. And so we actually started to date through running together and I felt like that was safer. And um, so just baby steps. Um, and so we ran and 
I saw him respect me. I saw him um, enter into my story very carefully. And then I made some requirements to him, like I want you to interact with my mom and dad, my adoptive mom and dad, and get to know them and bring other people in so they could see red flags. And I can say it wasn't easy. I can say that um, we experienced challenges within that, but I can also say that we have a very healthy and normal marriage and that he very much is dedicated to intentionality within learning about me and my needs just as I am desiring to be a student of him. And so, yeah. Thank you again on behalf of our 2018 NCLS participants, the cadet wing, and the faculty and staff of the Air Force Academy. We would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Thank you.